Hi everyone, it's Dr. Antonelli again, and uh, this is going to be coverage of another section of Chapter 9, Rights and Responsibilities of Teachers, Students, and Parents. Uh, remember that Part uh, 1 of Chapter 9 really talked about the basis of school law and what legal responsibilities states and school districts had, um, and now we're getting into specifics of teachers, students, and parents. So let's uh, first focus it on teachers. And when we talk about teachers, uh, teachers have a number of what we call legal responsibilities. Now, as you know, most um, people think of things that teachers need to do, let's say, in the classroom, like they need to assess and they need to uh, make sure students are on task and they need to do a whole bunch of other things. However, in today's discussion, I need you to keep in mind that we're talking just the legal responsibilities under the law, okay? And there are a number of them we're going to discuss. So keep in mind that there's a term called in loco parentis. And this is a term that really means in the place of parents. So what we're referring to here is that when students during the school day are in the care of teachers, then teachers are taking the place of parents at that time. So that's just an idea to keep in mind over all of these legal responsibilities as a teacher. Okay, the first one, which you see here, is preventing liability. Um, there's something called tort liability, which is where there's a wrong against the right of another. So someone does something to kind of violate the rights of someone else. That's known as tort liability. And there are actually three kinds of torts which is something you probably should jot down here. Um, the first kind of tort is called negligence. And negligence has to do with a standard of care that anyone provides, and in this case we're talking about teachers. And a good example to remember what negligence means is if two students are in school and they exchange some sort of medicine that they've brought to school, whether, you know, let's say, for example, Tylenol or some other kind of medicine, um, and the teacher does nothing about the two students exchanging this medication and one of them gets sick, let's just say, then the teacher can be found to be negligent in that situation, okay? So a second form of, of tort, which goes under this liability, is known as an intentional tort. And an intentional tort is um, assault or defamation where someone, let's say a coach, for example, um, doesn't like the performance of one of their athletes and they kind of slam them into the locker because they're very angry. Now, I know that sounds like a crazy example, but it's a good example to um, you know, demonstrate the idea of what an intentional tort is. And then the third tort is called strict liability. And this is an injury that could happen to a student um, as a result of some unusual hazard. So a good example of this has to do with, let's say, um, a student in a chemistry lab and um, they spill a chemical and it gets in their eyes and the student was not wearing protective eye gear, so there was a safety issue involved. That's an example of strict liability, okay? So just so you have an idea. So under preventing liability, we have tort liability with three kinds of torts, negligence, intentional torts, and strict liability. The second legal responsibility a teacher has is to report child abuse. This was um, an initial piece of legislation or act in 1996, and it was reauthorized in 2003. And basically what it says is that teachers are required by law to report all suspected, that's the key word, suspected cases of child abuse. Uh, child abuse takes the form of, it takes the form of, could be physical abuse, mental abuse, sexual abuse, or negligence even. Um, so there's a variety of things that fall under this category. So for example, if you are a teacher and you're noticing a uh, obvious one for physical abuse, you know, bruises on a student, you are legally responsible to report that um, through the hotline. Now, again, if you're a new teacher, I always tell my new teachers, you might, of course, want to discuss first with the principal or administrators um, in the district so that they can help and assist you in making the uh, call to report, okay? Um, the third legal responsibility of a teacher is to avoid sexual harassment. Teachers cannot sexually harass students, staff, 
their colleagues or parents, okay? Um, there's a general definition of sexual harassment, anything that's an unwanted or um, unasked for kind of could be comments, it could be, um, you know, anything that a person feels uncomfortable with could fall under this category, okay? So again, it's a legal responsibility of a teacher to avoid sexually harassing anyone within their workplace, including students. The fourth one under legal responsibility has to do with copyright law. Um, copyright law, um, the law was in 1978, and it basically talked about it had provisions for copying um, things like um, articles that you might use in class or uh, taping of like video show, shows or videos that you will use in class or use of computer programs. Um, it, 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 it's, it's a huge area. However, I want to focus, you know, you on just the idea that um, when you're observing copyright law, it's a, a couple good examples to explain this and remember it is that a teacher can't go and let's say copy old, a workbook, the entire workbook, and give it out to each of their students if let's say they were short on workbooks. That would be a violation of copyright law. Um, in addition, if um, a, a little kind of exception to this is if you are teaching something one day and you see an article in the newspaper that night that kind of relates to what you were teaching and it's becomes then a teachable moment if you were to copy that article and then use it in class, let's say, the next day with students, that would not be a violation of copyright law um, because it's kind of this spontaneous use of something in a timely manner. Now, if you were going to use that article, let's say, the following school year again, then because it's done at a later date, then you would need to um, secure permission from the author, the newspaper, the periodical, wherever you're taking it from. Okay, and the last legal responsibility of a teacher is to practice ethical behavior. Now, we as a teaching profession do not have what we call a unified or universal code of ethics, like let's say the medical field or doctors have. However, the NEA, which stands for um, National Education Association, has developed kind of a code of ethics um, for student for teachers I'm sorry to guide them in their practice with students from a legal standpoint okay so just keep that in mind it can turn into legal uh, a legal basis this idea of practicing ethical behavior okay in addition to legal responsibilities things that a teacher must do or avoid in the legal sense there are certain rights that teachers have legally as well the first one is the right um, to non-discrimination. This is where teachers cannot be discriminated against from school officials or school district officials um, on, on the basis of their gender, their sexual orientation, um, anything along those lines. Um, they can't discriminate school districts cannot discriminate against teachers in the hiring and firing and promoting of teachers, for example, based on things like gender or sexual orientation. Um, and that becomes your legal right then if you feel you've been, let's say, terminated um, from your position as a result of um, your sexual orientation, then you have a, um, you know, a legal right to pursue that because that violates the non-discrimination piece, okay? You also have a legal right as a teacher to a contract, which contracts are usually negotiated between the teacher's union in the district and the administration or the Board of Ed. Um, and the thing with the contract is that you are expected to sign it, but more importantly, you're expected to read it before you sign it, okay? So that if you've read it and signed it, you are agreeing officially to those terms. And so while you have a legal right to it, if you don't read before you sign, then sometimes that legal right kind of gets a little muddy and that you don't, you know, there's going to be things that may come up that you said, I didn't know, and that's not going to be a good enough explanation if you've signed it. Okay. In addition, you have a legal right to tenure. We've talked about tenure. Tenure is this kind of guarantee of a job every year um, after a certain amount of time. Um, I told you most K-12 teachers, the period for gaining tenure is three years and one day, meaning you teach successfully and effectively for three years, um, have good evaluations, 
and you are then rehired every year and when you step foot in to your classroom on the first day of your fourth year you are granted this idea of tenure. Um, there are two sides to tenure. Um, one is it helps to prevent uh, teachers from let's say being fired for what we call arbitrary reasons like uh, you know principal doesn't like you or they do like you or um, the other side of it is it protects incompetent teachers teachers who aren't doing well and aren't effective um, are now kind of grandfathered in to um, the system even though they may not be effective teachers okay so unless they've committed some sort of felony or crime um, it's very difficult to remove a tenured teacher from their position uh, another legal right as a teacher is your right to get an evaluation, meaning principals or administrators come in and evaluate your classrooms. You definitely want them to do that um, so that your evaluations can be used as documentation for renewing your contracts up here as your other legal right. And you also have uh, a legal right to know the grounds for dismissal if you are not being rehired. Okay. Sometimes these grounds for dismissal could be you refuse to do your job or job duties in some way, you have excessive absences, um, or there's just budget issues. Um, there's a whole kind of set of things that apply for this, but you do have a legal right to know why you're being dismissed. Another legal right is teachers and teacher unions do collective bargaining, uh, meaning they work with the school boards to iron out the details of a contract. And you also have a legal right to strike if you are in a state that allows a strike. Some states do not allow teachers to strike. Okay, so that's something you would need to kind of think about depending on where you're teaching um, and the union who's um, representing you. Okay, and the last uh, piece of a legal right as a teacher is you have the right to academic freedom. Academic freedom means that you can teach how you want and you can express views on a subject. For example, the idea of creationism versus evolutionism. If you remember, we talked about that as one of those topics that um, we often see in court cases. Uh, however, if you are teaching something that we call is disruptive to the educational process, then you may be at fault for, you know, exercising ac academic freedom when it is not your legal right then, okay? So it really does depend on, um, you know, what topic you are and if it's disrupting the educational process. Otherwise, this is a legal right for teachers to teach how you want. You're able to express your views, um, but there's always little pieces about if it's disrupting the whole uh, learning environment in the classroom, then it becomes kind of iffy. So keep that in mind uh, when you're dealing with academic freedom. Okay, so we've talked about legal responsibilities of a teacher and legal rights of a teacher. And then in part two, um, I will talk about legal rights of students and legal rights and responsibilities of parents. So we will go to this piece and this piece in another uh, voiceover. So look for that. Okay, have a good day. Bye.